Good morning. I'm Sherman Stanford, and this is Making Sense of the Chaos. Uh, Bill and I talked yesterday, and we decided that we've been giving those basic uh, principles of reality, see the world through God's eyes every day, and maybe, uh, maybe we'll leave that alone for a while. And every few days, we'll take them up again just to be sure that we're keeping our focus. But we'll start in today right away on the subject of eschatology, which is, of course, uh, the study of the last things or the end times. I said earlier that there are uh, basically three broad esch eschatological positions. Uh, <clears throat> one is uh, premillennialism, another is amillennialism, and the third is postmillennialism. And they uh, <clears throat> all have millennial in their name, and that's because they're named in reference to how they view the thousand years that is spoken of in Scripture that is uh, apparently to come. Now, amillennialism doesn't believe there's going to be uh, a specific thousand years, or maybe that, that thousand years um, is undifferentiated the rest of history. Uh, there are differences in, in that group. <clears throat> uh, Premillennialism is divided up into dispensational premillennialism and historic premillennialism, and we'll get into the distinctions between those two in postmillennialism. But basically, premillennialism means that uh, the millennium is yet to come, and Jesus uh, returns before the millennium. Okay, and postmillennialism believes that the millennium, the millennium is, uh, there, there are different views among that as well. Some believe that it's coming in at a future time. Uh, some believe that millennium is not a, a literal thousand years, but reference to a long period of time. Uh, but they all, all post-millennialists believe that Jesus returns after whatever the millennium is considered to be. So those are the, the basic positions. But let's uh, go over the rules of how to interpret first. Well, well, first of all, even why are we discussing this? It's tempting to think, well, why don't we just leave everybody with their own opinions? Because uh, does it really matter? Well, living in the cultural soup that we live in, I can understand why people would think such a thing. Because uh, we have come to view truth as uh, relative and uh, essentially just individual opinions. And if truth really is just your opinion, well, first of all, none of this makes any difference except uh, just as a kind of intramural uh, contest to see who has bigger spiritual or intellectual muscles than the other. I don't believe that, and I don't think you believe that. I believe that truth is uh, absolute, and it exists whatever we may think about it, uh, and our opinions on the truth don't make any difference. Our relationship to the truth makes a lot of difference, whether we understand it correctly or not. Uh, if I misunderstand a truth, then I don't have the truth. I have error. And uh, as a Christian, of course, I believe that the truth not only is absolute and certain and can be known, but that the truth is Jesus Christ and the truth sets us free. Well, because the truth sets us free, then it has to mean that if you take that coin and flip it the other way, error enslaves. Now, if it's true that error enslaves, which errors? Well, to a greater or lesser extent, all errors. Okay? If you're a an engineer, and you make a, an error in your physics, in your engineering, as you design a bridge, um, you are enslaved by that error, and it will produce a terrible result somewhere down the line. That bridge will collapse, and when it does, your enslavement to that error will become manifest to everyone. Now, errors don't always become manifest to everyone, or even to ourselves. But errors are errors, and they're not truth. 
And if what we want is the truth, then that's what we need to focus on getting. Now, why do I believe that I know the truth better than anyone else? That's a very good question. And a lot of times, I ask myself that very question. Why? Well, there isn't anything necessarily special about me that means I know the truth better than anybody else does. But if I have arrived at rules that help me to winnow through error and truth and find truth, um, and I follow those rules more faithfully than most people, the likelihood is I will see more truly than they do. Now, you have to determine whether you think I see more truly or not. And if you don't think I see anything truly, then you shouldn't be watching me. There's no reason to. Why would you want to listen to what anybody is just opining about? And he has no basis for what he's saying, except it's his opinion. Well, wonderful. You know, we've all heard the, the uh, comparisons of opinions to a certain part of human anatomy. Uh, everybody has them. Well, okay. But truth is truth. And so, uh, if we are committed to the truth, and if we believe that God has called us to present the truth to other people, then that's what we have to do. Uh, with all our flaws and faults, with all our failings, we still have to do the best we can to present the truth according to what God has showed us by the light we're given. And you decide how much light that is and whether you want to pay attention. Now, why should we even be looking at the question of the end times, that's, that's somewhere down the line, isn't it? What difference does it make today? <clears throat> well, it's kind of like, I, I did a lot of coaching. And you start a contest, and the end of the contest is down the line. Maybe it's an hour, maybe two, maybe three hours away. But it's, it's not here now. But this is true. And everyone who's ever coached, who knows a lick about what he's doing, knows this is true. That the attitude, the mindset of your players when you begin the game has a lot to do with how they play the game. And how they play the game has a lot to do with how the game turns out. And so as it happens, what we think about the future determines how we live in the present. If you expect, and you, and you know people like this, people who, who are pessimists, who always expect the worst possible result, they bring those results upon themselves because they make deliberate decisions, although unconsciously, but they're still deliberate decisions because they've chosen to be pessimists, that guarantee a bad outcome. And then here's the bad outcome. Their confirmation bias is confirmed. Their bias is confirmed by the bad outcome. And now they are even more pessimistic. And, uh, of course, the ball just keeps on, the snowball just keeps on going down the hill and getting bigger and bigger. On the other hand, if our attitude about the future is positive, then we're going to make decisions, positive decisions, that also impact that future, but they impact it in a positive way. Now, because it makes a difference in a ball game, which only lasts one, two, or three hours, and those differences are manifest and tangible during the course of that game, it certainly is not a stretch to imagine or to assume that the attitude that we take to the game called life, which we live 24 hours a day, not one, two, or three, and we live seven days a week and 52 weeks a year for however many years, 100, 70, 80, but whatever, it's a long time. And the law of incremental gains means that if uh, you're gaining just a little bit on the competition because your attitude is better each day, just a tiny little bit, hardly even measurable, but you add all those days together, and at the end of a 10-year period, it makes a difference. And it makes a difference in your life. That's the practical reason. But there's a reason that's not so practical, but nevertheless really true and really important. And that, that is that Jesus Christ is the truth. And everything that's true is an expression of who he is. And if we love him, we should love the truth. So, what does he say 
about the future. Uh, you know, the temptation is just to leave you in your little isolated cubicle feeling good about yourself. You know, I'll stay in my isolated cubicle feeling good about myself. I have my opinion, and I'm good with it, and you know, I can get along with life, no problem. But is, is that an act of love towards somebody else? Now, if, I, if what I'm trying to do is take my club out and beat you over the head and make you move out of your cubicle, well, that's not kind or loving. But if what I'm trying to do is show you the truth, then that is kind and loving. If you don't want to see the truth, go. You don't have to stay. I'm, I don't force anyone to listen to what I have to say or read anything I write. If you, if you think I'm crazy, you want to tell me I'm crazy, that's fine. If you want to listen to what I say, listen to what I say. But if your goal, like my goal, is the truth, then I'm going to do my best to help you to find that truth. If your goal is to confirm your previous bias regarding eschatological events, then I'm likely not going to be much help to you. Okay? So, uh, disclaimer up front. I think it's very important, the study of eschatology. I think it makes a tremendous difference in a culture. I think that a culture that has an optimistic view of the future of what God is doing in the world, that he will ultimately prevail, and that any defeats are always uh, for the purpose of entrapping the enemy and consolidating his own forces and moving forward, no matter what it may look like from our eyes. And we have to understand that our eyes, our finite eyes, they're mole's eyes. They barely see at all. And so the fact that we cannot see the, the truth that God tells us exists in the world means nothing. It means nothing. If, if I look around me and it, and it appears that the other side is, is winning, so what? You know, I, I coached in ball games where the ebb and flow of battle, you know, for a while it looked like the other team was doing really well. They were uh, kicking our behinds all over the field. But I would tell my team before we started that expect their best shot. They're going to make some plays. They're going to to have some successes and don't be surprised. So the question is not, will they have successes? The question is, how will you deal with it? And if you have a positive attitude in dealing with whatever's going on, you're better off than if you don't. So here we are. Okay, uh, <clears throat> eschatology, because it's dealing with, uh, because it's communicated in such symbolic language, figure and, and, and metaphor and simile, you'd think that that would be the widest latitude in um, oh, generosity toward others who are different or uh, hearing challenging views toward our, our own views. But, but that, that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, we find that uh, very few subjects are more hotly disputed than eschatology. Uh, um, Pre-trib, mid-trib, uh, dispensational, <laughs> premillennialist, will fight just as hard among themselves, although they substantially agree on everything, except just these few little points. Well, why? Ah. <laughs> you can speculate all day long. I, I, I don't have an answer, and I don't need an answer. I just open my eyes, and I see that it's true. So we have to deal with that. Uh, anyway, remember now, it's truth, not error, that will set us free. Therefore, we have a vested interest in discovering the truth that should trump the emotional need to hastily stake a position, which is then defended at any cost, even the cost of truth and honor. And, and you must make a distinction in your own heart. You have, to, you have to be committed to the truth, not committed to believing you're right. And there's a huge difference between those things, and it's very easy to confuse them, very easy for anyone to confuse them. And if you're not constantly asking God to show you are you trying to confirm your own biases or are you trying to find the truth? You will slide into that bias confirmation mode where, where what you're looking for is anything that tells you what you want to hear. You know, if you get on the internet, you have to read what the other side is saying about anything. You have to let them challenge you and you have to take their challenges in the very best light that you can, always being kind uh, and remembering that it's in Jesus that you stand when you give an answer for the hope that lies in you. So you give it in a way with gentleness and humility in the way that Jesus commands that you do. That's, by the way, that's a, um, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. It's a, a paraphrase. Uh, but 
let's not stake out a truth position and defend it with all our, uh, our egos, okay, with our pride, as if it defines who we are. What defines who we are is God. And our commitment needs to be to the truth. And if somebody is wrong, we should be able to listen to what he has to say and be kind to him. And even if we don't have a response, we can just kindly agree to disagree. Uh, and then go look for a response. Go look for an answer. But don't be satisfied to dismiss what somebody says because, well, you know, it's just stepped on your toes. That's going to happen. That's going to happen. So anyway, I'm, I'm going to be stepping on a lot of toes. And I know that. And, and I don't want to pretend that I'm not doing that, but I want to do it as kindly and gently as I can, although I'm not naturally a very kind and gentle person. I'm, I'm not. I'm not. Um, I, 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 am, I am naturally a logician. I, I have a tendency to just block things off and go step, 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 and not notice that I just ran over seven people. I try to remember not to do that, but I confess that's not my strength, and so... You need to understand that. I'm not trying to make an excuse for myself, but I'm not going to be able to step outside of who I am. I need to be the best man I can be as a Christian, but I'm going to be Sherman Stanford. That's who I am. We must especially guard against the desire to think ourselves right at the expense of actually being right. The stronger the emotional commitment we feel to a belief, the greater the likelihood of self-deception because of the tendency to identify the belief uh, with ourselves. In that case, disagreeing with somebody disagreeing with our belief, then they're attacking us. Okay, well, I'm not attacking anybody. I am attacking a belief system that I think is wrong. But I'm not attacking you. So I hope you can see the difference between those two things. And if you have something to tell me, I'm not going to take it. I'm going to do my best not to take it as you're attacking me, but you're attacking what you believe is wrong about my belief system. That's fine. That's fair game. I mean, that's, that's how this has to be done. But we have to look to an independent standard as far as we're able to keep us from just Retreating into my opinion, your opinion, he said, she said, because that, that goes nowhere. Now, what is that? Well, it's, it's rules for interpreting Scripture. We start off believing that Scripture is true. It does not contradict itself. And therefore, if we find passages that seem difficult to understand or seem to be in contradiction or at least in tension with one another, that we have to assume there's some way to rationally understand both passages as true, to harmonize both of them. We don't just say, oh well, oh well, um, contradiction is part of life. It's not, okay? It's not a legitimate part of life, okay? It cannot be a legitimate part of your belief system or your thought system because the thing then would be uh, legitimated as being okay to be true and not true at the same time in the same sense okay and so you tell me a is b and i say to you operating under the presumption that contradiction is a an acceptable part of a belief system i say to you i agree with you fully a is b and i think you're absolutely nuts a is not b and you look at me and think well how can we talk because the man is contradicting himself. You get the point? We can't live in a world where contradiction is an accepted part of rational discourse or even rational thinking. It's not. It's not. And to the extent that we're doing that, we're wrong and we're introducing confusion, not clarity, into our thinking. Now, these rules that we find, these are what's called hermeneutics. They're especially valuable because they're unchanging. Okay, I mean, once you decide this is a good rule to follow in interpreting a written passage of anything, then you follow it all the time. And if you follow it all the time, even handedly, then the result you get is the result you get. Now, if the rule turns out not to be a good rule because you see in practice it doesn't work, well, then you have to scrap it. But you have to use a rule 
that you apply across the board to all passages. If you're not doing that, then you have a double standard. And a double standard comes out of a double-minded man or woman. And to be double-minded is to speak with a fucking tongue. Okay? It's, it's to accept contradiction as part of your belief system. And there we're right back where we just were. You can't live there. So you can't have, you can't have that. And, you know, we, we routinely complain because we see in the world double standards being applied. Well, sometimes they're really not double standards. It's different situations. And so a different standard needs to be applied because the situation is not the same. Okay? But we, we, we need to always remember to look to see whether we're using the same standard all the time in, uh, where it's applicable for the same sort of situation. Does that make sense? Let's move on. Okay. What's the first rule of hermeneutics? Time will get to it, huh? Well, the first rule is that we take um, clear teaching passages and we use those as bedrock truths upon which we found our system and we build from there. Does that make sense? What, what does God actually tell us in clear uh, didactic passages, that is, teaching passages, where, 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 the God, where the design of that scriptural passage is to teach us a truth? Right? Now, the difference between those passages and other passages, for instance, uh, if you have a passage where, that's talking, it's a historical passage, okay? and uh, it describes an event that occurs. All right? For instance, we read about uh, the Hebrews in the Old Testament. They were all circumcised. All right? So, now we have a description of something that happened. Do we turn that description into a prescription? That is, not just telling us what happened, but what should happen, what we should be doing. Does it become a rule for our lives? Well, in fact... Not because it was described, but because it was prescribed in the Old Testament, it was a rule at that time. But because in the New Testament, Paul specifically says that rule is no longer applicable, now we baptize, then we don't circumcise anymore for religious reasons. Now, you may do it for medical reasons or because you think it's fun or whatever, but you don't do it for religious reasons. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. What's a clear didactic passage? Well, how about Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, where it says, this is Jesus speaking. Okay? There are no inferences to be drawn from what he says. I mean, I mean you can draw all kinds of inferences, but, but the clear truth of what he says is the clear truth of what he says. Okay? He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, uh, go therefore, and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. All right, it's, it's clear, clear passage. All right. So now we have this clear passage. Well, are there any passages that are less clear that need to be interpreted in light of that? Well, certainly. And if you have a, um, a figurative passage, a passage that uses symbols and metaphors <clears throat> and if that passage seems to contradict this clear passage which one do you think we should use as the standard by which to understand the other should we use the one that's um, symbolic to understand the one that's clear or should we, should we use the one that's clear to understand the one that's symbolic to limit it or whatever which do you think well, you're right. We use the clear passage, not the one that's less clear. If what you're looking for is clarity and truth, then you use the more clear to understand the less clear. And the most clear passages are the ones that are uh, intended to teach us specific truths. Well, the, we have those. Bam, that's that. All right, you put that down. Anything that you find that seems to raise a question about that, you have to understand in light of that clear passage. Now remember, Scripture does not contradict itself. 
But the writers of Scripture come from different perspectives to present truths. And so they use words in a lot of different ways. And you have to, you have to understand how, what was the um, practice in using those words at that time so you'll understand what they're saying. For instance, we just gave you that clear teaching passage that all authority in heaven and on earth is given to Jesus. And that he will be with us till the end of the age, which means the judgment day. So we're supposed to be going out doing this with Jesus with us till, till the judgment day. Now, there are other passages that speak of stars falling to the earth or heavens being rolled up like a scroll. And those appear to suggest a sharp historical discontinuity of the earth's physical continuation until the judgment day. At some point before that, there's going to be all these things happen, and, well, are they going to happen? <laughs> if they appear to contradict the clear teaching passage, then we need to look to see if there's a, a way to understand these that does not contradict these clear teaching passages. Well, there happens to be a way. If you look in the Old Testament, we see these same passages used regarding kingdoms that were destroyed back then, although these things did not literally happen, but that's the way that's the kind of language that God uses to describe the destruction of civil governments, of kingdoms on the earth. Well, if you understand that, if you see it in the Old Testament, you see how it was used in the Old Testament, you, you look at the clear teaching passage in the New Testament, and now you have a much clearer understanding. Should you be looking forward to the stars falling to the earth? I mean, listen, if a star, a single star... The, the smallest star we're aware of is the sun. It's 93 million miles away. If it got half that distance away, it would incinerate the earth. So, a star falling on the earth, or stars falling on the earth, clearly is symbolical. It's not intended to, uh, to have a literal meaning, to be taken literally. It has a literal meaning, I apologize. But it's not to be taken literally. So what, what is the literal meaning is what we need to be looking at. <clears throat> so when a, uh, an apocalyptic passage appears to contradict a clear teaching passage, the hermeneutic that we use requires the apocalyptic passage, since it is symbolic and figurative, to be understood in light of the clear passage. It's a rule that we'd like to have followed in our own writings. I mean, if you write somebody something, and, and, and you, you make a metaphorical statement, you don't want them to interpret that as if it were a, um, intended literally. It has a literal meaning, but you're not intending it literally. If you say, uh, I was as hungry as a horse. Well, how hungry is a horse? Is that literal? Well, that's a literal meaning, but that's not intended to be taken literally. Anyway, none of us feels fairly treated if our clear statements on any subject, either orally or in writing, are interpreted by the vagueness of less clear statements we have made and are thus twisted into meanings not intended by us. We regard that as an unfair attempt to subvert or obscure rather than discover the truth we intend to convey. Another good rule to follow is to allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. What does that mean? Well, if you have two passages talking about the same thing, and they don't seem to be saying exactly the same thing, well then, let's look at all the scriptural passages that deal with that, and let scripture tell us what it means, instead of deciding arbitrarily that on the smorgasbord principle, let's see, I like this one, I don't like that one, I'll choose this one, and I'll just disregard that one. You're not allowed to do that. If what you're trying to find is the truth, everything in scripture is true. It's all true, and it must all be understood as a single totality. And so if you're rejecting or discarding or ignoring any parts of Scripture, even if you're just doing it um, that way, you know, I'm, I'm not looking, I'm not looking. It's wrong. Okay, don't be doing that. You, you, you're going to lead yourself astray. You're not going to be in the truth. And if the truth, Jesus Christ, that is, is the most important thing in the world to you, you don't want to be doing that. A corollary of that rule is never to allow a single passage to set aside a teaching clearly established by many passages. In such a circumstance, it is wiser to seek to harmonize the apparent contradiction in some other way. 
You understand that? <clears throat> and, 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 and you see this often. Somebody will say, this is what the Bible teaches. And someone else will come up with, with a single passage, the only passage in Scripture, that if taken to mean a certain thing, would contradict this series of passages and contradict the entire teaching. And they say, well, see, this is really true, not that. No, they're both true, and you need to understand the one in light of the many, not the many in light of the one. It's the other way around, okay? It's, <clears throat> it's, it's just insanity to, to, to do it um, using the one passage to trump all the others because you, you like what it says. Well, what you like and you don't like cannot be the rule by which you interpret Scripture. It cannot. If that's your rule, you might as well just throw the Bible away. Write your own. What's the point? Okay, do you want to know what God has to say, or do you want God to say what you want him to say? Are you going to be like uh, that friend I had years and years ago who told me that her God wanted her to be happy? Well, I'm sure he did. But I'm also pretty sure that he wasn't a he. He was a she, and he wore her clothes. And when she looked in the mirror, that's she saw her God. And I don't think her God could save her or anyone else. Okay, Because the God that I read about in Scripture is not interested in your happiness or my happiness. He's interested in his glory. Now, he's not trying to make you unhappy, but your being happy or not being happy is not his prime consideration in anything. He does not exist as your genie in a bottle to serve you. You're not Aladdin, you don't have a lamp, and you aren't able to get a genie out of that bottle. It does not work. Many people pray like that, but it does not work. Anyway, that's enough for one day. We'll take this up at this point tomorrow. There's still a great deal more to talk about in this. And once again, it's going to be stepping all over your toes. I'm, I'm sorry in advance that it's going to feel that way. But if we're going to look at the Bible and try to figure out what the truth is, then the truth is one. It's not many, and it matters. Okay, and We need to try to find that one truth, <clears throat> not many truths about each different thing. No, that, that cannot be so. Bill, is there anything you'd like to add? Okay. Well, very good. Uh, I hope to see you tomorrow. I hope you see me tomorrow. It's hard to remember that I don't see you because in my mind I do see you. All of you. Each, each one of you? No, all of you, not each one. <laughs> that is impossible. At any rate, remember this, there are more things to fear than death, and the worst thing to fear is being unfaithful to God. God bless you.